everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Sometimes we love a good phone call, hearing the voice of someone you care about, conversing with someone who brings you joy. The telephone can be a wonderful thing. But what about those other times? What about the heavy breathers? The mysterious voices lurking beneath static. Imagine, it's late at night and you're alone. Suddenly, your phone rings. You glance at the caller ID, but it's an unfamiliar number. And there it is. The heavy breathing. The chilling sound of a voice that sends shivers down your spine. Who's on the other end? That's not all. What if the call is from someone you know? Someone who's passed away. The voice on the other end sounds eerily familiar. Their words filled with a haunting urgency. Or add another layer of perplexity. Receiving a call from a loved one who's still with us. But they don't have any recollection of ever dialing your number. It's as if the call never happened in their reality. Is it a glitch in the matrix, or is it something more sinister? Which is more terrifying? The fear of an unidentified caller whose intentions are unknown? The notion that the departed can still reach out to us, breaking the barriers between life and death? Maybe it's the disconcerting feeling, realization, that someone you hold dear can call you. But it never transpires in their reality. Tonight, these stories take us to places where familiar become hauntingly strange. So, let's get started, shall we? I was driving home along a rural road. I'd just left a friend's birthday party and planned to call my husband when I stopped at the closest gas station, as that's what we would do when either of us would hit the road. Before even making it that far, I heard this incredibly loud bang. So loud and intense, it actually momentarily rocked my vehicle. After literally a couple seconds of sheer, life-altering panic, I regained my composure. Briefly, I wondered what part of my car had been busted or fallen off, and then my cell phone rang. I pulled off to the side of the road, and I saw that it was my husband, so I picked up. What happened? he asked, alarmed. Are you okay? At first, I assumed he was referring to my car, but I quickly reasoned with myself that there's no way he could have experienced that or known that I have all the way at work. I sensibly answered, Nothing's wrong. I'm fine. Unsure of what he meant. You just call me screaming and crying from the side of the road and nothing's wrong? He barked. I thought you had a car accident. How did he even know I was driving? I thought to myself. I swear, I didn't call you. I planned to, but I hadn't made it that far yet. It must have been someone else and you confused the call with me. I suggested this. He's a psychiatrist, so it wasn't the most unusual suggestion. No, it was you, hun, he insisted. I'll show you when you get home. I really thought something terrible had happened to you. I'm totally fine, I said. Just driving home now. I'll see you later tonight. I got back on the road and stopped at the nearby gas station. I was relatively surprised to see that there was absolutely nothing wrong with my car. Despite the combustion sound so loud, it actually shook it. Everything checked out, even under the hood. My husband calling one second after that sound would indicate that he got the alleged phone call from me at the exact moment of the boom. Honestly, I'm not sure what happened that night. I do know that my husband showed me his call log, and sure enough, there was a call from me at the time he'd claimed. 
I'm not sure if we breached some time-space barrier, or if we somehow experienced an alternate reality just for a second. Either way, it's just one of those moments we have no explanation for. This happened when I was in college, circa 2017, my junior year. Back then, I drove my dad's old Toyota Corolla, and it certainly didn't have fancy locks that automatically locked when I was driving, or that were automatic in any way. Normally, for this reason, I tried to keep all of my doors locked. However, on this night, I had been designated driver for all of my friends. I had just finished dropping everything off, and I was headed home for the night, and I didn't think to check the doors. Though, clearly, no one had locked the door, because while briefly stopped at a red light, a man suddenly opens the back door and dives into my back seat. He proceeds to tell me to drive. He didn't ask very nicely, either. It was demanding. I was scared. Then the light turned green. I hesitated for one moment, and he told me that he didn't want to have to shoot me. He said this while pressing something against the back of my neck. I was wearing a scarf, but I could feel that it was something heavy. It felt like a gun. That's when my foot hit the gas, and I sort of went into autopilot for several moments as he told me where to go. As we drove further in a direction I wasn't familiar with, I couldn't help but start crying. I don't know if he heard me or saw me through the rear view, but my tears did not make him happy. He started swearing at me to shut the fuck up, that I better not make things worse or harder than it needs to be. I remember thinking I really should shut up, but I couldn't get myself under control. We kept driving until we were eventually in a more residential area. Not a nice one, I should add. We were for sure in front of a crack house and I could feel myself sweating, becoming increasingly more panicked about the situation. The guy orders me to parallel park, and all I can think about is how much harder it will be to leave in this situation. But I'm still feeling confident that I can attempt it once he exits the car, unless he makes me go with him. The thought of being removed from my car was horrifying. I needed for that not to happen at all costs. I racked my brain for excuses to stay in the car, but then he ordered me to do exactly that. That's when I noticed a big man on the front lawn of this house. A heavily armed big man, and he was getting closer to my car. Backseat dude gets out, and that's when I see that he's truly armed with a weapon. He gets patted down by the big man on the lawn. The big man removes his weapon while pointing in the direction of the house as if giving him permission to go inside, and almost instantly the big man's attention is back to me. He stands right outside my driver's side door, aiming one of the larger guns down at me, finger on the trigger, all while staring at nothing but my hands. I remember sitting there wishing there was anything I could do safely to remove myself from the situation. The most tormenting part was that I had a fucking gun in my glove box. I just knew I wasn't going to have a chance to grab it before possibly getting shot to pieces myself. Not to mention, my single stack didn't stand a chance against whatever this guy was holding. All I could seem to do in any of these moments was look at my surroundings and look at the clock. After an agonizing 11 minutes, the backseat man returns... For one second, the big guy has to take his gun and eyes off of me, but I panicked before he's already looking back at me, and the guy is getting back into my back seat. Once again, armed, he's immediately barking orders at me, telling me where to go. For the most part, he didn't say anything. This gave me some time to think. I considered driving to the police station, until I realized that I had no idea where it was. I started to brainstorm what excuse I could come up with to have to stop this car again. Almost ten minutes had passed since we'd left the crack house, but 
Dude was really just having me drive in circles. I had no idea what his game plan was. During that time, I told him I had to pee. He told me he didn't care. I told him I needed to call my roommate so that she didn't get worried. He told me to fuck off and keep driving the loop. So I did. I managed to stop myself from crying several times, but I was absolutely hopeless. We'd stopped at a few stop signs on this ten minute drive, and at each one, I considered tucking and rolling right out of the car and letting it keep going. But again, I didn't act. I just panicked, imagining this guy shooting me right there, me dying alone. How incredibly devastated my parents would be. I knew I was on the verge of a full-blown panic attack, and that's when I saw the dude was lighting something back there. I smelled something chemical-esque, and it was harsh coming from the back seat. This guy was absolutely getting high as fuck in my back seat. The smell was disgusting. I didn't know what it was, and I didn't want to know. But part of me was thinking, if he's using his hands to smoke that shit, where's the gun? Since it was dark, I was confident that I could at least reach for my phone in my purse. It was near my lap. So I slid my right hand into my purse and glanced down to see if it lit up, and it did. As the man continued to smoke, I clicked the lock button five times. According to my dad and whatever he'd set up on my phone, this would call 911. I looked down but couldn't tell if the screen had changed. I really hoped it had. Please be calling goddamn 911 right now. I thought over and over. I was so focused on my plan working, I'd hardly notice the guy talking to me. But then he raised his voice. He was demanding that I pull over. But by the time I realized where he was pointing, I'd missed the gas station. He yelled for me to turn around, to turn the fucking car around right now. He was adamant about hitting that gas station. So again, I listened to what he said, and I made a U-turn. Pulling into the gas station, I was discouraged at first that there were no cars there. But before I had even put the car fully in park, the backseat man was opening his door, yelling for me not to go anywhere. And then he jumped out of my car and vanished inside the store. I couldn't believe it. I was both stunned and so incredibly grateful at whatever stupid move this was. I immediately put the car in reverse and peeled out of that gas station so quickly, not giving a shit if a cop or any other authority saw me. I was desperate to get the hell out of there. I actually found myself laughing hysterically on the way home, and that's when I remembered I'd tried to call the police. I grabbed my phone and could see that I had been unsuccessful in my attempts to call authorities. I'd been successful in escaping this strange criminal, though. And I was grateful that this experience turned out to be more scary strange than horrifying, life-altering. Really could have gone so many ways. Just be smart and always remember to lock your doors, save yourself the experience, and just take the lesson from me. I was posted in a primary health care center with a fellow senior doctor. It was our night shift and he had started to tell me stories of the time when he was doing autopsies in the same hospital. He was shifted to primary health care because he couldn't deal with the trauma that came later. He said that not all autopsies led to hauntings, but it was people who had killed themselves or cases of assault where the death was unnatural. It were these cases that led to some of the most disturbing paranormal activities. One such case he narrated that night was of a woman, mid-twenties. She was first assaulted and strangled, and later her body was thrown in the well by her in-laws. Such incidents are common in rural areas of India. They hope to escape the charges, but after thorough examination of her lungs by my colleague, the senior doctor who had done her autopsy, it was obvious that she was killed first and drowned later. The in-laws of this woman tried to pay a hefty amount to him 
so as to escape the charges, but he refused. After that incident, he said that he often saw the woman, wet hair, bulging eyes, naked with a pale body, often sitting by his bedside, just looking at him. He said it wasn't sleep paralysis. He was shattered with fear one more time as he was combing his hair in the bathroom mirror and saw the same woman just peeking at him through the door. Only her eyes and her wet hair were visible through the mirror. It became so traumatic that he left that part of his profession completely, even though he was getting paid a lot for that job. He said he doesn't ever wish to go back. And the fact that it was the same hospital where I'm working right now, kind of creepy, not gonna lie. I guess I'm just going to dive straight into this one. At 10, my grandmother took me away from my mother because both of my parents were addicts. They'd split up and gotten back together a few times when I was younger, but dad spent most of my life in prison, and now that he's out, his brain is so fried that he doesn't even remember who I am. My mom married another addict, and they actually got sober when I was about 16. Her husband stayed clean, but she fell off the wagon after about six months. My entire adult life consisted of her getting sober to con her way into my life and then robbing me blind before disappearing again. I fell for it every time, but I'm not going to make excuses. I was just naive. Well, now I'm 30, and I just had to scatter her ashes at her favorite lake. Back in December, she got pneumonia and... Thanks to a lifetime of heavy drug abuse, her immune system was completely shot. Her health declined rapidly, and it was soon clear she wasn't going to make it. Eventually, she fell into a coma, and it was left on me to end her life support. As difficult as that was, everything was made so much worse by the fact that I was completely alone for the entire process. My mom burned every bridge she'd ever made, even her sister refused to come. The confession happened just a few hours before she slipped into a coma. She was telling me how sorry she was for everything, all the usual stuff. Then she got really serious and straight up admitted, I killed that girl in 96. I knew what she was talking about right away. My parents would often get back together for a short period of time when dad got out of jail but this incident was the last time they ever spoke. I don't personally remember many parts of it, but I've grown up hearing the story and accusations from all sides. It had a big impact on our lives. Somehow, Mom found out that Dad was seeing another woman, someone that they were partying with and buying drugs from. She got him really drunk and high before confronting him. So it turned into a huge fight during which Dad said that he was going to leave her for the other woman. I'll just call her Vicky. It didn't take long for the fight to turn physical. Dad broke Mom's nose, and she hit him with something right back. It ended with both of them bleeding, but Dad was also unconscious. Mom drove to Vicky's house and pretended like she wanted to buy more drugs and hang out. They took turns shooting each other up but my mom gave her way too much. Vicky immediately knew what happened, but by then it was already too late. Mom stayed and laughed at the woman while she went into convulsions and passed away. Then she drove home and went to bed. The next morning, Dad woke up alone on the couch, right where he had passed out, and remembered enough of the night and the fight to know he needed to warn Vicky. Mom was asleep, so he wasn't too worried yet. First, he tried to call Vicky, but she didn't answer. He decided to drive over. It was when he actually got into the car that he noticed the seat had been moved and began to get nervous. Then, he got to her house and found the door unlocked. That's when he knew. As a rule, drug dealers don't generally leave their doors unlocked. Sure enough... Vicky was dead. He told paramedics and the police that he thought it was murder. 
but they knew exactly who he and the woman were. It was ruled an accidental overdose, with essentially no investigation. And that was the end of it. But Dad told everyone who would listen that Mom murdered Vicky. Mom, of course, denied everything and said that Dad was out of his mind. I always knew my mom was a bad person, but I never believed she was a murderer until I heard it from her own mouth. For so many years, she tried to gaslight Dad into thinking he was crazy, but all that time, she actually was guilty. I wish I would have listened. His drug use got so much worse after that. It was only a few months later that he went away on a 15-year sentence. And now, he doesn't even remember who Mom was, let alone Vicky. So yeah, that's my deathbed confession story. Thank you for sharing it. It's amazing how much this kind of stuff actually happens when drugs are involved. But it's just another prime example of why you should never try meth. Not even once. Hey again. I don't think I mentioned my name last time. It's Trent. But I'm the guy who had a demon follow me to my dad's house on Christmas break. I left school, stopped at the cemetery to visit my mom, and next thing I know... There's a demon in our house. It continued haunting us through the holiday, and I didn't go back to school because I couldn't stand the thought of leaving my dad alone with that thing. Obviously, he wasn't going to let me quit college over something like that, so I did return, and the demon came with me. I'm glad I didn't leave the burden on my dad, but the weeks since returning to school have been insane. My roommate, I'll call him Nick was already back and we spent the first night just catching up and playing Call of Duty. Sometime just after midnight, he commented that it suddenly got cold. Only a few seconds later, he changed his mind and said that he must have imagined it. We had the heater going and he was sitting closer to it. So I immediately thought of the demon, but didn't say anything. We both smelled something rotten a little bit later, but it faded fast we spent most of the next day out with friends, but that night, I woke up at 3 a.m., freezing, with a dark mass leaning over me. I tried to scream, but a shadow hand reached out and covered my face. I couldn't move, breathe, or make any noise at all. My lungs began burning, and I think I eventually passed out from the lack of oxygen. When I woke up in the morning, I was covered in sweat and had red marks on my face. I didn't want to discuss it, so I said that I must have scratched myself in my sleep. Then, Nick said that was wild because he dreamed a shadow man came into our room and tried to smother me. He wanted to help, but he was paralyzed, and that made him realize he was dreaming. So he went back to sleep while I was being suffocated. I'm not blaming him, just stating the facts. I couldn't admit everything that happened at my dad's house until the following weekend when things got even worse. Saturday morning, we woke up to the sound of a blackbird slamming into our window. I got up to look outside and it was lying dead on the ground. It happened five more times over the course of the day. The smell also began appearing more often and we were both having awful nightmares several times a week. Finally, I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. Nick was more accepting than I expected, but by then he was ready to accept almost any explanation. The next day, he invited a girl over from one of our classes because she said she was psychic. I've never believed in that sort of thing, but like him, I'm open to just about anything at this point. She came over later that night and said that she felt a dark presence the moment she came through the door. After walking around for a few minutes, she asked where I might have made contact with the entity. Once I told her it was at the cemetery, she asked if I did anything disrespectful while I was there and listed a few examples, one of which was urinating. Apparently, it doesn't matter that I stepped away from the graves. At least, not as far as this demon is concerned. 
Next, the psychic girl wanted to know about my dreams, so I told her, and she asked if the entity possessed me in any of them. When I said no, she was really relieved, and she said that there might still be time to do a cleansing. It's not like I knew of anything else to try, so I agreed, and she brought two friends over the following day. They did some kind of ritual with a bunch of candles, herbs, and chanting, but I didn't feel different during or after, except for how bad the smoke irritated my sinuses. A week later, I had the worst nightmare yet, where the demon was on my ceiling, directly above me, and dropped down onto my chest. It was so heavy, I couldn't breathe at all. It felt like my ribs were going to snap like toothpicks. Meanwhile, the activity around our dorm also started getting worse. Nick had to build a model bridge for a big test grade, but it fell off the desk during the night and an entire section collapsed the same day it was due. The psychic girl talked to some more people that she knows and now they're coming over this weekend to try something else. She said if they could learn the demon's name, they would be able to banish it, or short of that, they could try something to trap it in a bottle or box. It all sounds pretty insane to me, but there's genuinely nothing I won't try at this point. I constantly feel like I'm losing my mind. I can't eat, I can't sleep or study, my grades are suffering, I'm always paranoid and on edge, I'm at my absolute limit. If anyone knows anything else I can try, please comment below. I truly can't keep living like this. I can't. I just moved out of my parents' house and was living over the top of my dad's business. It was a funeral home, so it was common for florist deliveries. However, there was a sign on the door that no deliveries were accepted after 5 p.m. But someone came to my door with a bouquet of flowers. I wasn't seeing anyone at the time and knew of nobody who might bring me any. It was late and it was a bad area, so I didn't answer the door. I had video surveillance at the time, and I could see the person on the monitor. They were knocking, banging, and ringing the doorbell. They seemed to know that someone was living above the funeral home, and would stop and look up at the windows. I watched as they walked away, leaving the flowers. I went downstairs, but not wanting to open the door, I waited out of view. Sure enough, the person came back for the flowers. The next day, I heard on the news that someone living over another nearby funeral home was assaulted by someone delivering flowers. When one of my grandmothers passed away, I was young. She'd been angry with me because of decisions that I'd made after asking for and ignoring her advice, then learning she was right. She hadn't spoken to me for quite some time prior to getting sick. The day she passed away, I'd gone to the hospital to see her and let her meet my six-month-old daughter. She was so weak, we really couldn't talk, so nothing was really said except I love yous and lots of tears. We'd been home for about an hour from visiting her when my phone rang. Someone else answered and said it was for me. It was kind of late in the evening and unusual for a call. I said hello and heard a woman's voice, very weak, on the other line saying, Everything is okay. I love you. The line went silent. Chills ran over my entire body and I froze for a minute. It was my grandma's voice, but I knew she couldn't make that phone call. I immediately called the hospital, and the nurse told me that I needed to contact a family member. They couldn't tell me anything. I called my grandpa and was informed that about an hour after I'd left the hospital, grandma passed away. 
No one had called anyone in the family yet. The only ones who knew were those that were with her at the time. I fully believe that call was from my grandma after she passed, to let me know she always loved me, even when she was angry with me. I always knew that, never doubted it. In 2017, my sister, Candace, was murdered during one of her husband's drunken rages. Let's call him Earl. For years, we begged her to leave him, but he was always sorry, and he always convinced her to stay. Then the inevitable happened. It happened on a Thursday night. Oh, he didn't mean to kill her. We knew that he would never do it on purpose. After all, who would cook his dinners? wash his clothes, if not Candace. But then he finally hit her one too many times, and my sister was the one who paid the price. We pay for it, too. I'll always feel like we should have done more, but she's the one who will never get to see London or write a book. That's all she really wanted from life. She called me the night it happened. Earl was mad because she cooked a casserole instead of a roast. The dumbest thing. But the fight was supposed to be over by then. When we spoke, he was nodding off in his recliner, and he didn't usually get up again after that. We talked for about 20 minutes before Candace said that she was going to bed, and everything seemed fine when we said goodbye. At 1.42 a.m., I woke up to my mom calling. I thought my dad must have had a heart attack, but no. My sister was dead. A neighbor heard their fight and called the police but they arrived too late. Earl had fractured her skull, causing her brain to bleed, and she passed away en route to the hospital. I did not handle it well. We were only two years apart, so we grew up as best friends. We told each other everything, did everything together, and then she was just gone. It's not much consolation given the price, but for what it's worth, Earl got life in prison. I spiraled into a deep depression. If not for my partner, I don't think I would have survived the first week. The funeral was particularly difficult. I couldn't stop crying, and I didn't want to live anymore. I couldn't eat or sleep. That night, I laid in bed trying to sob quietly so as to not to wake my partner. And I thought, this sounds crazy, but I tried to summon my sister. As kids... We would say that we were as close as twins and try to summon each other with our minds. We actually convinced ourselves that it worked a few times, but we hadn't done it since we were little. I don't really know how to describe exactly what I did. I've never been so desperate for something in my life. I reached out with my very soul, and I begged the universe to let me know Candace was okay. That somewhere, somehow, in some form... She still existed, and it was that exact moment that a glowing white orb came through the wall and hovered above the foot of my bed. I thought I must have been dreaming and woke my partner, but once they saw it too, I started bawling in earnest. It was really her. She only stayed with us for a minute before floating back through the wall, and we never saw her again. But that's what allowed me to finally begin some semblance of healing. I was worried that a shared dream theory would bother me later. So I used my fingernail to scratch a small C into the nightstand before going to sleep. Now, every time I feel overwhelmed with grief, I look at it and feel comforted knowing I'll see her again one day. There's nothing worse than losing someone you love. Life is so short. Please don't take each other for granted. You truly never know when you might be sharing your final conversation.
Well, friends, it appears we've reached the end of tonight's episode. Thanks for joining me. Whether it's your first time or you're a regular, your support means the world over here. We've got brand new episodes every Friday night. Keep those eyes open for those deep sleep videos. And of course, double features. Subscribe, tap the bell, and you'll never miss a thing. Big thanks to those who shared their stories. And a huge shout out to all of my patrons, whom we appreciate so very much. Tracy S., Tamara K., Monica L., Zoe Watt, Shelley B., Donald C., The Dark Cosmos, Marion T., Rat Girl, Alicia S., Aaron G., Nikki H., Mr. Revenant, Naz K., Brendan G., Paul T., Nicholas C., Lizanne, Arlene F., and Adrian. If you want to support The Darkest Hour in other ways, consider joining my Patreon patreon.com slash the darkest hour or click the link in the description to learn more do you have stories like these i'd love to share them send them to me amanda darkest hour at gmail.com or on the darkest hour subreddit the darkest hour yt stay spooky <laughs>